Yeah, so it's three o'clock. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the monthly webinar on the four spectrum system and based analysis network group at Organ Geochemistry. And uh, we will have a very, very interesting webinar uh, today given by Dan Conford, Laura Milne, and David Gardiner from IGI. Uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you know IGI very well. A very good consulting and research company located in the UK, in Devon, I think. And basically, the title of this talk is probably also an award winning title because it's extremely nicely written with the uh, title saying Traditional and Machine Learning Techniques Apply to All Sorts of Correlation in Norwegian C. And or are we able to end the speculation? I mean, the main idea behind this webinar is that can we differentiate between ore, source, oil, and gas, or ore, source, gas, or is it any oil coming from ore and spec? And then Basically, this will be a very, very nice topic. Many, many people are interested. All of those working in Norwegian Sea, they face the same problems. So basically, the main author of this presentation is David Gardiner, and uh, he graduated in most, uh, as a Master's of Geology from University of Southampton, and then joined IGI in 2011, worked as a geochemist and business modeler, and now he's having the role of senior uh, consultancy manager and also uh, advisor for, for IGI and Dan Comfort is the, uh, the leader of IGI now and Laura is also working with them. So basically, um, I don't want to steal more of the time. The presentations will be about 45 minutes and please all of you mute the microphone except of course the presenter. You can write the questions in the chat and then after the 45 minute presentation I can read up the questions and also you can raise your hand and then you will get the the chance to ask live. It will be recorded and then basically uh, we can watch it later on. So I mute myself and welcome Laura and Dan and also I could see David also join in the, in the talk. So welcome. Thank you. So I'll just share the screen, hopefully it'll work. Um, great, yeah, ideal. Um, so welcome to the talk and um, this is just a bit of an outline of kind of the uh, approach of the, the study and, and what we'll cover. So the first part is essentially an, an introduction to sort of the study area. So what do we already know about um, about the region um, and kind of what approaches we would typically use in a geochemical study to interpret particularly the differences between the spec and the aura formations. And then I'll pass over to Dan and he'll focus primarily on the machine learning approach. So predicting um, source based on classification, uh, the interpretation of the machine learning models and, and how impacts um, of maturity have on that. And then just conclusions and suggestions for, for further work in this area. So just a, a bit of an, an overview of the kind of typical workflow that we would use in a, a geochemical or, or base model and interpretation, because this can be quite useful to kind of contextualize everything and kind of see where machine learning can actually fit into this. So the obviously the first aspect is lab analysis. So you know from your basic source rock screening, carriage and characterization, up to more technical higher level techniques um, such as GCMS and stable isotope analysis on oils, gases, or any fluids, source rocks. And then that data would be compiled into a geochemical database. So that's essentially what we've used to start this interpretation. Um, so the, the area is just of Norway. We've downloaded that from the NPD Metis database. Um, and that contains the geochemical data and all of the sort of associated metadata in order to, like I say, contextualize the, the geochemistry. Um, and then quality control the data. So just see if there's any, you know, very unusual outliers that need to be removed um, before interpretation that might skew skew the, the final results. And then moving on to kind of, you know, the, the main bit of the interpretation. So source rock, oil and gas interpretation. So the, the, the fundamentals of source rock interpretation. So looking at quality, um, maturity, variations in deposition environment, flashes. And that really kind of builds the sort of bedrock to build on and, and kind of correlate the oils and gases to those potential source rocks. And then the final section, you know, basin modeling, which can be in addition to the gas there to the, the geochemistry section. And here we can look at 
predictions of maturity, so in areas where we haven't drilled, um, looking at migration mapping and also risks of biodegradation, of uh, phase predictions, prospect charge risk and um, PVD predictions as well. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of kind of the arrows interlink all of these aspects um, because they're all kind of intrinsically linked, really, and all feed back to one another while we're doing the interpretation. So for the study area, we've so, uh, selected samples from um, Norway and focusing primarily in the Norwegian Sea. Um, in terms of the rock samples, like I say, we're focused on kind of the what would consider to be the key potential source rocks uh, for where we have data. So those would be things from the Cretaceous and the Jurassic section. So uh, obviously the Spec and the Aura, but also the Melka um, and the Cretaceous Langa and Lea formations as well. And we've also taken um, out a lot of the fluid samples from all stratigraphic intervals in order to kind of use those for correlation potentially. So just to give a, a very brief overview of the kind of key source rocks, I'm sure you're all very aware of what those are already, but just to kind of set the scene. So the spec formation, obviously the key source rock that we would consider for the area, um, you know, very oil prone, predominantly consistent type two kerogens, um, deposited sort of marine, open marine environment. It can be quite uh, heterogeneous, both vertically and laterally within the Norwegian Sea, which can obviously contribute towards those different signatures that we see in the fluid accumulations. Um, and in terms of maturity, we see it's typically um, of lowest maturity out to the east on the Trondheim platform, and then more mature when we go out to the west um, and significantly all mature um, very far out into the west in the more environed basins where you've got a very thick Cretaceous uh, package. And you can see that reflected in a lot of these plots as well. So, for example, these are some of the key kind of standard plots that I would use for um, source rock interpretation. And you can see that we've got, you know, quite um, high S2 values, good organic carbon values, which reflect in these high hydrogen indices, and that supports that, you know, really good oil prone um, character to the spec. And that's also supported by high lyptonite contents as well, so more oil prone. And then we move on to the aura formation, and this is another very heterogeneous source rock. Um, it can be a mixture of Primarily type three kerogens, but locally we do see more type two contributions as well. So we've got that mixture of potentially gas generation and also oil generation. Um, and a lot of authors have highlighted that, you know, the kind of potentially earlier charge by the aura formation that's migrated might have essentially paved the way for later migration of spec derived oils. And this heterogeneous nature of the aura formation, you can see that again in these plots as well. So you can see a huge range of, of quality for the aura formation, dominated by rich night masterols, so more gas prone. But we do tend to see you know, some lyptonite content as well, again, supporting that, that mixture of gas and, and oil prone source rock. And maturity patterns we're seeing the same as what we see for the spec. So immature in the east and more mature out to the west. And this slide highlights some of the kind of key geochemical plots that I think a lot of authors and what we personally use as well to kind of distinguish between the spec and the aura formations. So the first one being the stable carbon isotopes, so the aromatics and saturates. And you can see that we do kind of have a bit of separation of the spec and the aura formations. So the aura formation typically being slightly isotopically heavier in areas, which supports, you know, that obviously more terrestrial environment that we see for the aura formation. And then the more isotopically light spec formation reflecting that more kind of marine um, type two deep position environment. And then looking at the ternary plot as well, so we're looking at C27, C28 and C29 sterines. Again, this kind of separates out the samples. So you can see the aura formation, for example, tends to have slightly higher C29 serines, again, reflective of that terrestrial input to the source 
And then finally, Christine fighting. So this is quite a nice plot as well to kind of show the separation between the more terrestrially derived, particularly coals within the Aura Formation, which have higher pristine fighting ratios and the lower pristine fighting ratios of the, the spec formation. And obviously it's important to note, you know, by looking at these kind of quite distinct characteristics here, but when you look at accumulations of oils, for example, you've got mixtures of different source fascies, different source rocks, maturity, and then alteration, which affects that. So there's a lot of different aspects to kind of account for, obviously, when you're interpreting the fluids. And then just highlighting some of the other potential source rocks within the region. So like I mentioned previously, we're looking at the uh, Cretaceous section as well. So in the more and boring basins out to the, the, um, the west, because of that large thickness of the Cretaceous section, the Jurassic is typically very highly mature. Um, and there are some evidence, um, there's some evidence of Cretaceous sourcing within kind of more western fields, so Orman Langer, Elida. Um, a lot of these fields do have some characteristics of Cretaceous sourcing, for example, quite high values for the Nordiacolistane ratio in the oils which reflects that potentially Cretaceous sourcing. And then in the Jurassic, um, we also have the Melka formation, but this tends to have slightly lower potential, I think, than the Speck formation um, and also the Aura formation as well. And then finally, the Paleozoic. So a few authors have mentioned um, the potential of Paleozoic sourcing, kind of more um, well-developed terrestrial, even like a strain source rock characteristics in the Norwegian Sea. And then finally, just this kind of final slide from, from myself. So this is just highlighting kind of what the authors and, and what literature kind of has out there in terms of likely sourcing of the fluids and the accumulations within the area. So I think it's relatively consistent that a lot of people believe that the bulk of the hydrocarbons, so the C15 plus fraction of the hydrocarbons is generated from the spec formation. And it's the natural and vertical variations within the source rock that actually contribute towards the different geochemical characteristics in the accumulations. Um, and they've also said that, you know, potentially we've had earlier charge of the aura formation that have reached the accumulations, but then it's the later charge from the spec formation, this moderately mature um, oil, highly concentrated with biomarkers that essentially just swamps the signature of the aura formation and the accumulations. So we're essentially just kind of focused on the spec formation charging the accumulations. And then obviously, you know, out in the West, like I said, we've got potentially Cretaceous sourced hydrocarbons from the, the land and the layer formations, which show the best potential in the area. Um, so I'll pass over to Dan now. That was quite a quick, quick overview. Um, So I'll just remember to unmute, otherwise that will be a rather uh, dull presentation. So I'm going to just take over now from uh, from Laura and I'm going to introduce the kind of approach that we took to this using a, a more of a, a data driven approach, a top down approach, if you want, uh, using machine learning. So as Laura described, we brought together a, a large data set using the, the public data um, that the MPD released um, that's hosted on our, our Metis system. And we uh, selected data from within that. In the talk that follows, I'm going to focus largely on uh, extracts from potent the, the potential source intervals that Laura outlined. Uh, we've tried to remove the stains and shows from those and focused on uh, kind of looking at the existing indicators of uh, source and particularly characterizing the stratigraphy, the stratigraphic, uh, the source stratigraphically. Um, and then we went further than that and started to then build a series of machine learning models. Um, and I'll go into much more detail on that in a minute to try and classify now um, the uh, extracts in terms of the source rocks that they uh, were generated from uh, using a series of, of classifiers. And uh, that's really a very data driven approach. So we've looked at a whole range uh, of different explanatory factors. We try and determine which ones are important and then build models that would classify the extracts in terms of the uh, 
source intervals and use those models to then predict the uh, probability. So we've got a probabilistic model here uh, that will try and predict for the oils uh, which intervals they're likely to have been generated from. With all the caveats that Laura already explained about, well, there's a suspicion that these things may be mixed, etc. But I'll go through uh, that in, in more detail. So the research questions that we kind of focused on were to ask the question, well, look, if we've got a very large number of inputs, what are the best predictors for stratigraphy now from our oil fingerprints, if you like, or really our extract fingerprints here. So we look at a bit of feature selection. Um, prior to doing that, we had to do a lot of data cleanup, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Then we asked the question of what kind of models are appropriate actually for classifying um, the source intervals. Can we uh, build appropriate models? And that's exploring a whole range of classifiers and looking at also the sensitivity of our, our modeling uh, choices. So the sensitivity of the decision making to the modeling choices. Uh, it became evident fairly quickly that maturity varies fairly significantly across the region of study. So we wanted to look at whether maturity was having a significant impact on our ability to classify um, the, the source stratigraphy. And finally, can we actually then use those learnt models and apply that classification to the fluids, so to the oils from the region? Uh, based on what we've learnt from the extracts, can we then characterise these oils? So that's the kind of uh, agenda for the, the meeting. So the first thing is we're, we're dealing with, with real data here. So uh, we're, we're dealing with samples from the, the Speck, the Ura, the Melka and the, the Langer and the Lear. And um, as I said, we, we already removed samples that we felt should be stained. So now we're focusing just on the extracts. And um, we had roughly 700 samples uh, where we had extracts measured across a reasonably uh, wide range of uh, conditions, so maturities, etc. Uh, we added in as well as the, the sort of GC and GCMS ratio. So we took all ratios that had a significant amount of data, i.e. more than one sample with them being measured effectively. So 134 different GC and GCMS ratios. The vast majority are in GCMS. In the GC space, we only focused on some of the, the, the kind of pristine phytane related uh, ratios. Uh, also some isotopic data, um, so bulk isotope data and isotope data on the uh, the SARA fractions, as well as some, some information on the SARA, because we knew that was going to be important. And I'll come on to the, the vitronite reflectance data in a bit. So uh, the data itself is, is kind of interesting. So this is a data set of opportunity. It's a regional study. We're looking at the entire Norwegian Sea. And if you look at the proportion of data that's missing here, so I'm showing here uh, the, the amount of data uh, or percentage of data missing per column, and here the percentage of data missing per row. You see there are a large number of rows with a large number, a large proportion in excess of 80% of its data missing, and a large number of columns with it in excess of 50% of, of the data missing. We're going to have to do something with this missing data. So there will be inevitably an imputation strategy to fill in those missing data values. And so the pre-processing actually was a three-way um, sort of uh, refinement of the data to look at. So initially we excluded all features, all columns, all ratios, where there were more than 70% of, of values missing. The rationale for that is if you're having to replace that over 70% of your, your values, you're trying to borrow a lot of power from the, the 30% of the samples that actually uh, have measured values. So we excluded a significant number of features, which had more than 70% missing. Then we'd uh, exclude samples, which once you've removed the 70%, uh, the features with more than 70% of their values missing, had more than 50% of their values missing. And then we came back again to the columns, to the properties, to the ratios, et cetera, and removed any uh, remaining columns with more than 40% missing. Now, what that gave us is a data matrix, which was fairly near to being complete. Um, and, and that we ended up with around 400 samples there with uh, 65 features. So not every single ratio could be included because there were too many missing values. 
Um, we then used a, a nearest neighbor method. So finding the samples which were most similar in that data set, which had values for the missing values and used a weighted, a distance weighted average of those nearest neighbors, five nearest neighbors to fill in the missing values, which is a fairly robust a non-parametric way of estimating missing values. And that gave us a complete uh, data matrix. As I go through, I'll describe how we looked at the sensitivity um, of our results to the choices we made uh, with uh, removing missing values, because it turns out some of the things are quite sensitive, but I'll also explain why that's the case as we go through. So our focus here is on feature selection. So we wanted to identify those ratios that were important in being able to distinguish the different stratigraphic intervals. So a traditional workflow might have said, OK, you've got 65 different features, loads of ratios here and some carbon 13 isotope data and a bit of SARA data and a bit of maturity information. Maybe what you would do is you do a, a PCA to reduce the, the number of uh, variables that you had to look at. So we could reduce it with uh, reduce the number of variables with principal components analysis. People might be then inclined to look at those principal components and, and the, the scores of the samples on those and via the component loading start to interpret them and say, oh, PC1 is about maturity and PC2 is about depositional environment and PC3 is about, let's say, fractionation effects through migration or biodegradation or whatever. Now, the reality is PCA doesn't really do that because PCA builds a linear combination of all input variables. Some of the impact of the inputs may be small, but in general, most principal components will have significant contribution from a significant number of uh, variables. Once the principal component analysis is done, the temptation then is to cluster in that principal component analysis uh, space to try and define the groupings. And that's an entirely valid thing to do. It's a good strategy if you don't have labels. But here we're going to take a slightly different approach because we do have labels for the extracts. So we believe the extracts are representative of the source rocks from which those extracts were extracted. And so we have labeled data, which we can use to train the classifier. For the oils, obviously, we don't know uh, the, the source rocks. Those are mostly from reservoirs. Uh, we're not dealing with, with tight oil or anything here. So for the extracts, we have the labeled data. So we could train a classifier. Now, the benefit of training a classifier is we're using the fact that we already know what the answer is we're looking for, for the extracts. Um, to pick up then which inputs, which of the features that we, we're passing in. So these are the ratios, the uh, isotopic um, measures and the, uh, the kind of bulk uh, characterization. Which of these are important in terms of being able to choose the decision boundaries that inform whether the um, extract was sourced from the Speck, the Aura, the Melka. And um, we actually grouped the Langer and Lear formations together. So the Cretaceous intervals would be grouped together. One of the challenges is that there are lots of ways we can look at this uh, feature extraction and each have their own strengths, but also associated weaknesses. Once we've determined those important features, we then build our final classifier on the extracts. And then uh, using that classifier, we can then ask the question of, can we apply that classifier to the oils? And then what's the probability of those oils being sourced from that particular interval that the classifiers learnt to label from the extracts. So that's the strategy we're going with. It's very much a classification strategy. It could be used alongside PCA and clustering, but here we're just going to focus on the classification. So uh, feature selection in classification, and, and just a, a warning, I'm going to rattle through this quite quickly, so apologies, but there's quite a few slides that I need to get through. Um, so I won't go into detail in all of this, but um, if there's interest, I'm very happy to talk offline afterwards uh, about the, the, the detail of this. But we set up basically a classification problem where the formation, uh, in this case, the, the uh, various potential source intervals, is uh, given as a, a function of our inputs. And our inputs here are the 65 uh, ratios um, that we've we've used effectively, which have a reasonable amount of data where we were able to fill in any missing values and give a complete data matrix. And we trained a whole range of, of classifiers here. 
Um, the first approach we took to feature selection is what's called a, a, a greedy forward uh, selection method. So uh, what that means basically is we're going to use cross validation. So we're going to withhold some of the data. We're going to train a classifier on the, the remaining data. And we're going to say which classifier best predicts the withheld data and we'll choose to add one property at a time and we'll choose the property that best improves the classification. So basically the first property here that we select is the most discriminative. Um, and in this uh, um, presentation, discrimination is what we're after. And obviously, generally, that's a bad thing. Um, but in this context, we're after a good discrimination. So which of these um, properties allows us to split the formations best? taking one at a time and we add them then sequentially. So the second one is the next most informative in terms of being able to classify our samples. And so this uh, greedy forward selection mechanism it has some limits, but it tends to be fairly robust when combined with a, a, a cross validation strategy. So we use the five fold uh, cross validation strategy. Now, interestingly here, um, we see that depending on the classifier that we use. So here we use a nearest neighbor classifier with 10 nearest neighbors. So we're looking for classifying the um, resulting. This is a non parametric estimator. We classify the stratigraphy purely based on the surrounding points. It's nearest neighbors in Euclidean space, uh, I should say here. And here we use a support vector machine uh, classifier. So this uh, looks for representative samples and tries to find representative samples that split the data up maximally, find the maximally separating uh, hyperplane in, in this case. So we did actually use a lin uh, this is a sorry, this is a radial basis uh, support vector machine classifier. So this doesn't have linear decision boundaries. It has curved decision boundaries as sort of illustrated over here. Uh, what you notice is the two classifiers select not entirely different, but quite different um, inputs. And that's a little puzzling and a little bit worrying. And we'll come on to why that is in a second. So we also looked at a slightly different approach to feature selection, and this is a more model based approach. So here we use tree classifiers. In fact, we use a decision forest is the, the, the word for it. It's just the number of tree classifiers. So a tree classifier just splits the data incrementally uh, on different partitions. So it makes a decision tree. It's like training an expert system if, if you want to go back to the old AI kind of uh, days. But rather than just training one tree, we train 5000 of them. And we look from those 5000 trees at how the each of the features helps to reduce the impurity of the um, classification. So it helps to split the classes out again. It's all based on the same kind of underlying principles of trying to find things that allow us to separate the classes. And the classes here are the different stratigraphic units that we're targeting. And uh, because we're using now a feature importance score, um, and this is a, a decrease in, in impurity, we then can set a threshold and say any features that are above that threshold we would consider to be important. And interestingly, a lot of the features that come out from here are the same features that are picked out, uh, particularly by the uh, nearest neighbor classifier, but some of them are also picked out by the support vector machine, although um, felt to be less important. Um, so you, you might wonder, well, well what's, what's going on here? Why are we getting different results depending on the classifier? Um, the results are inconsistent, um, and we explored the sensitivity of this to uh, um, assumptions that we made during the treatment of missing values. And indeed, they are slightly sensitive to that. So you do get the broadly, the generally the same features, but individual features will pop in and out. And I think the, the reason for that is largely linked to the structure in the data set. So if you look at the correlation, so this is a heat map of the correlation matrix for actually a, a more complete version of the data set where we've retained a larger number of um, properties to, to, to try and understand the structure in those uh, values. What you see, of course, obviously down the diagonal, everything's perfectly correlated, but there are some very strong correlations in this data set between values. And that's not massively surprising because some of the ratios are rather similar. They're ratioing peaks that are close to each other um, uh, and are similar in uh, 
the information that they convey. And I think this is what's causing the kind of popping in and popping out of certain features. But there's another factor that's coming into play as well, as I'll describe in a minute. So once we've built the classifier, we took a judgment over which properties uh, were going to be important. And we took a superset of all of the properties that were rained, uh, rated as highly important in at least one of the uh, classifier's judgments, uh, removing any that were very strongly correlated. Um, and we ended up with this set of uh, properties and uh, you know, the slides will be available afterwards if anyone wants to look in detail. Um, but we then from that built a Gaussian process classifier. This was the, the best model. We built a series of uh, classification models, but the Gaussian process cl classifier was the best performing. And we looked at how well that was classifying our extracts. So this is on the extract data where we know the source label. I say we know, um, I should just point out here that the, the actual assignment of the samples to the different stratigraphic intervals was based on the official NPD tops. And I suspect some of you may disagree with some of those assignments as well. But let's for now work on the basis that, that we, we can agree on these tops. So what you see here, this is a confusion matrix um, and it's named uh, as a confusion matrix, not because it should confuse you, but rather it should represent uh, how confused the classifier is. So in a perfect classifier, all of the values will come on the diagonal and everything off diagonal will be zeros here. So you're looking for a classifier that um, is uh, fitting everything on the diagonals. And in fact, when you look at the Ura uh, formation and the Speck formation, for the large part, we correctly classify the uh, samples which come from the Spec as coming from the Spec and the Ura coming from the Ura. What you will notice is the Melka is particularly poorly classified. So we often confuse the Melka with all three other intervals, both the Langer, um, Lear combination, the Ura and the Spec. So we, we're struggling to disentangle the Melka, but in general, we can tell reasonably well between the, the Spec and the Ura. Now, this is in the extracts, and this is important. Um, we also looked, because this is a probabilistic classifier, we looked at the calibration, but I'm not going to talk about that. So we did look at the ROC curves and, and made sure that our probabilities were calibrated. What that means is if we say there's a probability of 0.8 that this sample came from the URA formation, uh, eight out of 10 of, of the a randomly selected set of samples would actually come from the URA formation. So it's a well calibrated probability. Um, the um, Confusion matrix gives you more information about the sharpness, the degree to which you can be confident in the um, most likely class that it assigns things to. So that's the kind of context for the work. So now we can start to look at actually applying uh, this classifier. So here I'm showing uh, the same plot actually uh, effectively that Laura showed in the introduction. So this is a, a 27, 28, 29 sterane ternary plot. And this is the data that we use to train the model. So these are the extracts, the scale, the size of the point is the yield. Um, the color here is the formation where I've used uh, consistent colors to the, the colors Laura used. And you might look at this and say, oh, look at this. There's this really strong uh, terrestrial higher plant signal for the Ura. These are probably the coals in the Ura formation. Um, this should separate, right? This looks like these look different from uh, maybe the spec is, is, is coming more somewhere over here. Well, mm -hmm, kind of. It, it kind of looks separable, but actually does it. And we'll come on to, to why maybe it's not as separable as you might actually ideally like it to be. So we've trained our classifier, our Gaussian process, our probabilistic classifier on uh, this data. Now, on these other plots, and I'm just showing the results here for the Ura Speck and the Melka, um, but we can look at the Langer and Lear uh, later should we want to. We now apply this classifier to the oils. So we're taking the same input ratios, the same fingerprints, if you want, um, that we use to train uh, the classifier on the uh, extracts. And we're now assuming that the oils should have a similar fingerprint if they've come from the same formation. And now on this plot, the circles are the um, the oil samples or the fluid samples. Um, uh, you'll notice here 
several of them have this sort of light yellow color that's unassigned and that's because we don't have sufficient inputs to be able to assign those uh, to a particular formation. And a couple of things to notice, one is the oils all fall um, in a, away from this interesting region there. I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, the other thing to notice, notice is the probabilities are all fairly low. There aren't many samples where the probability of uh, the oils being spec sourced are above, well, there aren't any above 0.8. There aren't many above 0.7. There are a few. Um, and remember that when we're classifying these, we're actually not using the properties that are on this plot other than the 29 sterane ratio. We do include that as an input, but the 28 and the 27 aren't used, um, but we are using uh, 13 other properties as well. So this is just projecting this information onto the ternary plot. And we're able to look at uh, the these oils. Now, the interesting thing is most of the oils have very similar probabilities for the Ura, Speck and Melka. So that's kind of disappointing, right? I mean, what have we really learned so far? So we look at this more and we say, OK, we did this feature selection. The, um, these uh, hopane and sterane ratios um, were found to be one of the two most informative uh, properties from the uh, feature saliency scores. So we can plot these. And on this plot, we do see, again, some degree of separation. You would imagine here a cluster of kind of speck uh, sourced extracts and, and up here kind of Ura sourced extracts. But we see kind of the same thing that we've seen on the other plots. The oils plot in this central region and this central region kind of confusing kind of messy. There's not a very strong signal there. And again, looking at the probabilities, they're all roughly similar. So we'll use the same color scale on, on these plots as, as we have on the other plots. So focusing on this sort of central region here, most of our oils are in this part of, of the region. This area here, which is the area where we see a, a strong uh, indication that this is spec only, we don't see that in the oils. We don't see that signal. So it gets kind of kind of interesting. So the plot thickens a little bit. Um, and this turns out to be consistent across a whole range of plots. So we can take here the uh, most important properties as rated by the different um, classification uh, methods. And we can look at the distribution here uh, of the information of the, of the data points for the extracts and then we plot the oils on top of them and yet again the oils always plot in the region where the speck the ura the melka and, and the langa all sit together there's really very little discrimination possible you can start to look also at the maps and whether there's a spatial signal in these probabilities and there is and unsurprisingly, there is because obviously these are probabilities, they sum to one. So if there's a high probability that you're spec, there kind of has to be a lower probability of the oil being order sourced. Um, I should say here also, we assumed that this is uh, not a mixed system. So I haven't modeled this as a mixing uh, process, which would be something that would be interesting to do. So pretty much every property where the, form uh, where the oils plot, the formations overlap. So what was this a failure? Um, is, is, is this a negative result? Well, kind of, but you could always have a chance to learn from negative results. So one suspicion that, that we had is, well, there could be many factors that are causing this, right? There could be alteration effects on the oils. Um, Laura already explained that the literature kind of suggested that there could be overprinting here, there could be mixing, so an early charge from the aura followed by then uh, a dominating charge from the spec. We could be leaching things out as things migrated through, so uh, aura sourced oils migrated through the spec, maybe that could be going on, uh, so there could be some leaching of the biomarkers. Uh, we've not tried to model any processes on the oils themselves, so whether they're biodegraded, uh, fractionated through migration. So there, there could be a lot going on here that we're not modeling, but kind of on average, you'd hope that, that you were still getting some decent signal. Um, we know maturity is important in here, and we know that the intervals cover a whole range of uh, maturities. Um, 
there could well be mixing going on and I suspect there may be some preferential sampling as well. So when you're actually selecting the uh, the cuttings that you choose to analyze, um, I suspect something's going on there as well. So one of the things we did here was build a, a, a little uh, maturity model for the Norwegian Sea. And this is interesting, I think, because this is entirely data driven. So for a lot of the extracts, we didn't have measured vitronite reflectance. So we didn't know the maturity of the source rock that that extract was taken from. Um, so what we did was built an entirely data driven model of uh, vitronite reflectance. And I'm not going to go into detail on, on this model, but happy to talk about it later. So I'm showing you some cross sections through the Norwegian Sea um, here as a function of uh, burial depth. So this uses burial depth and lat long. So this is now the longitude along this axis. So we're going from east to west at different latitudes. Um, and we can also produce maps at uh, given burial depths of the equivalent vitronite reflectance. So I've used this sort of uh, key for the that's equivalent to the key that we use on on these um, depth plots. So here we can see uh, three of the wells where we've uh, fitted the model using all available vitronite reflectance data from the North Sea. It's just a very quick way of uh, defining a vitronite reflectance for every sample in your database and equivalent maturity for every sample in your database. Um, but it has an added benefit that it's smooth because we know VR measurements are very noisy and this borrows strength as well from neighboring wells. So I'd actually be a lot more confident about the blue predicted vitronite reflectance than I would about the, the orange observed ones, which include you know, reworked samples. They include potentially cavings uh, and, and vitronite reflectance is tricky to measure, right? So um, there's a significant noise on vitronite uh, measurements. So this was a, a kind of cool little thing that used a, a, a three layer, if you want a deep neural network um, to, to learn about the maturity. And we use that to predict the maturity for every uh, sample. So now if we look at um, in more detail at the uh, results that we got from the, the classifier, we're gonna focus in on these samples here. And these samples are the, the kind of coli samples, the more terrigenous uh, samples. And what I've done here in, in Piggy, I've just brushed these. Um, and you can see these fall all along a, a fairly narrow band in what I guess was the historic coast where this terrigenous material was deposited. Um, we see that that spans a, a, a fair range of maturities, but the vast majority of these samples are actually immature. They're not, they've not even got into the oil window uh, yet, not even the early oil window. Uh, there are some in the early oil window, but when you look at those, it turns out that they're not particularly um, generation prone. So they're quite uh, light in terms of the, the hydrogen index. So the higher hydrogen index samples uh, typically uh, have the, the very low maturities. Again, not massively um, surprising in a way because as the maturity gets higher you'd expect some of these sterines to crack and to move the the general spread of this data into this central region uh, where you see uh, a number of ura source oils uh, uh, extracts still being present so we we think that these uh, very strong terrigenous uh, indicated samples are actually not contributing to the oils at all in, in the Norwegian Sea, largely through maturity, um, but also possibly through um, the, the inability to expel. And this, this kind of goes into a bit more uh, detail on that and starts to look now at, at the hydrogen index of, of these uh, samples over here, the, the TOC. And, uh, and, and although these look like really good candidate source rocks, uh, they're not because the maturity for these high hydrogen index samples is pretty much ex exclusively um, below the, the, the onset of the oil window. So could that um, be, be part of the reason why we're, we're struggling to, to, to really classify uh, the Speck and the, the Ura? Well, maybe, but there could be other things going on. So when you start looking at uh, the actual uh, structure of the rock itself, um, these are two sort of classic examples of, of Speck uh, sourced cores, uh, very uh, or very homogeneous, relatively homogeneous uh, black shales. Uh, from some of the deeper samples, they become a little more heterogeneous. Um, but when you contrast that with the Ura, 
uh, you notice a, a big difference. Uh, and the Ura is, is noticeably more heterogeneous with significant vertical variability um, and, and this sort of intersec intercession of uh, more sandy and then coaly and shaly intervals. Um, so we don't think the coaly intervals potentially, although they're, they're potentially productive of uh, some fluids, the porous nature of the coals may mean that relatively little oil is expelled uh, from those intervals, which can be quite thin and, and probably wouldn't be enough to then migrate out beyond uh, the, the, the very much local areas. So those samples uh, which are appearing down in this region in the Ura, which look very separable, aren't actually contributing, as far as we can tell from the classifiers, to any of the oils. So maybe um, we, we've just looked at, at, at too big a level. So we're focusing on this region down here. What about in this central region where there's a, 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 a maybe potentially more structure? And there does appear to be some structure in here. But we have to remember um, if we kind of factor in measurement uncertainty, maybe that's roughly of this size. I got to confess, right, I totally made these sizes up, but they're based on experience, not on complete um, made up nature. Um, Interlab variability is, is significantly higher. So this is if you get a, a, a one lab to, to run it and on a consistent um, setup. If you're looking at, at data from a number of labs, the uncertainty just due to interlab variability is probably around this scale. And then once you start to look at the natural variability within all of the formations. So if you look at this in terms of the variability in the in the Ura, in the Speck, in um, the, the Langer and Lysing, and also in the Melka formation, it, it's significant and it's much more significant than any clusters. And you might be tempted to see clusters in this. You might be tempted to think, oh, this is a little cluster here. But when you select them, you realize they all come from one or two wells uh, and they're all sampling effectively the same very um, localized um, result. So this is a cluster that's due to the way that you've sampled the data. There's not actually a cluster in the underlying mechanism that generated this data. And in fact, what I'm fairly confident of from from all of these studies is when we use the indicators that we've used, so the ratios, the saturate to aromatic ratios, you really cannot separate the Ura. So to round things off, unfortunately, I have to conclude we are not able to end the speculation. And uh, thanks to Dave for that. That's Dave's main contribution to this talk, I have to say. Um, Laura will, will probably agree with me. Dave will be shaking his head violently at the minute. But um, so what did we learn from all of this? Well, we knew working with legacy data was going to be tricky. Data, data quality is definitely an issue. Missing data is um, horrendous. And actually, there's too little data here in, in, in some ways. Um, when you compare models, so I did a lot of work in this, comparing different classifier models, that actually helped me learn about the data. I already knew about what the models could do and what they couldn't do. So if you understand your models, you can actually use the models to learn about the data. A lot of statisticians kind of approach it the other way and they're always looking to fit the best model. Um, you shouldn't really be doing that. You should be fitting models to help you learn about the data. And that's a really powerful mindset to go in with you. Um, if your data is actually uh, giving you an answer, even if you don't like it, you kind of have to listen. So that's that's a bit disappointing. Um, there seems to be a lot more variability within each formation than between them. That that's, was already known, so I don't think that's a new contribution at all. Um, sadly, none of the measurements we use, so none of the ratios or measurements we used, were really significantly better than any other uh, when separating between stratigraphies. Um, and we hypothesize as well that these sort of more terrestrial sec sections of the, the Ura haven't produced significant oil, largely because they, they're not, they've never hit that oil window. They're, they're still immature. So that's the bad news. What about the good news? Well, a couple of things just to highlight here. So we did only stick with existing ratios. We didn't use raw peaks in this study, and we could definitely extend it to look at raw peaks. And with more modern data, it may be that some of those peaks are actually useful at separating these formations. But for the, the ratios we looked at, and that was a really wide range, 65 different uh, variables that we, we looked at, none of those separated the data. 
that's not to say it's not a separable problem. It's just to say that with the historical indicators that were widely available, we couldn't separate it. And I don't believe it's possible. That's not because we've used inappropriate models. We've used the most flexible models you can imagine, and they still don't separate it. So that tells me your data's inseparable. It's not a modeling problem. It's a data problem. Um, in what I've presented, we have really focused on the large scale. Um, there's some really interesting exceptions to, to explore. There are some areas where the classifiers are more confident about the source of, of the rocks, and it'd be good to, uh, source of the oil, sorry, it'd be good to explore that in more detail. So once you start to focus down, I think you'll also learn something useful from these sorts of methods. Um, it, it would have been nice to do a better job with the errors. I did a very crude job uh, with the errors here, and some kind of averaging, even a PCA might be useful there. Um, the, the other thing just to, to ask ourselves is, are we actually asking the right question? Is it useful to separate the Ura from the, the spec formation? Does that really matter? Is that the right grouping we should look aim to be looking at? Should we rather be looking uh, at some other grouping uh, that might be to do with, with depositional environment, kerogen types, various other aspects. So maybe the stratigraphic grouping is actually not helping us here because the stratigraphic intervals, at least in terms of the signatures of the extracts, are effectively indistinguishable with the data we, we had. Um, it would also be interesting to look at jointly predicting actually the source and the maturity. So maturity definitely has a, a big impact here and you want to take that into account when you're looking at your classification problem or your clustering problem. Um, and, and as I say, the models could always be improved. You could do slightly better with your noise models. You could tune things. You could probably get a, a five, 10 percent improvement in your misclassification rates. But fundamentally, if you want to do a, a better job, you need better data. Um, the, the models aren't going to take you much further here. So just finish now uh, on this note. So the, the, the one thing to point out, and this is my favorite saying, and those who know me will probably be fed up with me saying this, but don't believe in magic. If you can't, if it's not there, you can't learn it. It's got to be there to be able to learn it. And uh, finally, negative result, still an opportunity to learn. And that's the positive uh, in me saying that. So on that note, I will finish and uh, return it to Balash, I guess, to chair the uh, discussions. Thank you very much. Very good talk. And basically, then it means that we have to just do more to understand what is coming from where. But I have just a question. I have not seen any question in the chat. So if any of you have, oh, yeah, one. Yeah, so I will, I will read it up. But uh, basically, I just tell the, the audience that if you have any question live, you want, you can just raise the hand in the Teams. And then I just uh, first uh, read up Michael Lawson's question. I think he's from OKVP. Uh, Don Laura. Great presentation. Have you looked at all the geographic distribution of your samples from the Ore that seem to be marine influenced liptinity more towards the west? That's the only one in the chat. So, uh, yes, we did. Um, so um, I, I, I'm going to do something very foolish now and go live to, to Piggy and, and try and uh, show some of these these things in, in Piggy. So. Um, this is now actually I'll drop the Ura formation on here. So let me just uh, put the Ura on here. So uh, this is looking at the minute at uh, just the maturity of the Ura formation on, on the map. But we can also uh, look at the. Um, so I want to plot. What do I want to drop on that to do it? I can look. At, so if I drop my probability of being in the Ura onto that, and I need now the right sample set. This is where I'm going to really regret doing this. Uh, these ones. Um, oh, what have I done? <laughs> I shouldn't have done this. Uh, right, so in short, yes, and um, I'm now regretting deeply uh, trying to do something live here. So it may be easiest to um, brush these uh, samples. So when you're talking about the the kind of samples from the Ura uh, in this this more liptonitic region, you do see them um, well, that this is where they they plot. So uh, are they out to the west? Yeah, 
kind of, but not exclusively. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, Michael. So I, I don't think I actually asked whether they were from the West, but uh, okay. uh, no, just just looking at uh, whether basically your uh, you know your your variability in facies indicators from the geochemistry kind of conform to some kind of depositional environment expectation uh, and how it might vary within the aura yeah. itself. Yeah. No, it, it it very much does, and you see that um, in the uh, band that, that you saw when you, um, so if I just clear that and um, rather brush these samples here, you see very much these appearing in this sort of coastal band um, as, as you select these these samples. So yeah, there is very strong depositional uh, environment and, and a strong kind of geographic context to where the, the different samples will plot from from the order and that I, I think it's not just the positional environment it's also burial depth and, and thus maturity as well is having an influence on those signals cool thanks Dan I mean, we have more questions coming in <clears throat> from the second one is from Erwin Silza uh, with the order lying below the spec and not that far away would you not expect that many of the oils will be mixed with aura and spec contribution during migration merging in the migration pathways, in which case the stratigraphic component will be heavily overprinted by migration mixing effects. Uh, absolutely. I mean, that, that is, is, is definitely true. Um, in, in this um, uh, plot here, where we're looking in detail, if we go into the, the region where the oils actually fall, so this is these are just extracts, right? So the extracts I'd expect to be less mixed, but you are right if if um, Ura sourced oil has migrated through the spec and, and then that could leave a, a fingerprint of the, the Ura as well. So yes, I, I think there is a widely accepted view that the Ura has contributed to the, the oils in the region. I, I suspect it's the shaley bits of the Ura that actually have a signature very similar to the spec. Um, but you, yeah, we, we haven't explicitly modeled this is a mixed system. I, I have just tried to classify uh, here uh, purely into whether it's it's spec or Ura or um, Melka um, or Langelia. What I would say it's a probabilistic classifier, so it, it does cater for there being mixed signals. So it, it will give equal probabilities if it thinks the 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 two signals are effectively indistinguishable. But yeah, we, we haven't explicitly modelled the mixing effects, and, and I agree that they're, they're quite likely. Uh, another question, I just had some background noise here in this air conditioning in the room in the office, but Akram Orir is asking how many wells were used in this study? If number of wells is small, we may also have some systematic error from well to well in addition, and also is mentioning that there could be a collinearity problem that, as you stated, it may affect feature selection. Yeah. Have you first tried to remove features to reduce the collinearity? That's the yeah. question. No, it's a very good question. So in terms of the number of wells, we used all available information from the Norwegian Sea. So I don't remember, Laura, off the top of my head, how many wells. I think we're talking 130-odd wells. Um, yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head, but hundreds, yeah. It, it, it's it's all all available publicly available information in terms of the collinearity. So um, what Akram's uh, getting at there is that a lot of these features are strongly correlated. And I, I kind of showed in the um, in the presentation uh, the so I'll, I'll quickly whiz back to the the slide that's really relevant to this the correlation plot of of the inputs and. Uh, did I do any? No, I didn't do any feature selection uh, to reduce the collinearity. So you could use a technique, something like principal variables, to try and minimize the number of variables that you included that were very strongly correlated. I didn't do that. I relied on the feature selection to pull out the most relevant one. When you're using these sort of greedy forward selection approaches, that should be relatively reliable. But you are absolutely right. It, it, the, the feature selection was quite sensitive to that. And it's certainly a, an improvement that one could do is to take a kind of principal variables approach uh, 
Uh, for those who don't know, principal variables is a bit like principal components analysis, but rather than looking for a projection of your data, you're looking for a subset of your variables that best explain the, uh, the variance in the, uh, in the data set. Uh, so that could be a way of reducing the, the degree of collinearity there. Thank you very much. Any more uh, live questions uh, in the chat from the people? You raise your hand. I don't see any hands. So I have just one at the very end and one question. If you go back to the slide that you showed from Doc Carson and Odden, the 2000 and 95, when they stated some fields, yes, slide nine, I think it was, uh, it should be revisiting them. No? I, I think like so. Norma I, and those. I mean, the, the, the one thing I'd say there, Balash, is, is we didn't use CSIA data. So we didn't use the, the compound specific isotope analysis here. We didn't have access to sufficient volume of data for that. Um, so it, it may be, and, and this is the caveat I have to put on this, right? This is only as good as the properties we were able to use. So it may be there are still um, aspects of the um, intervals of the extracts that you can measure that would allow you to separate things. In all of the properties we looked at, you just get this this kind of um, this this characteristic group where the oils all fall in this kind of very mixed region. There was there were no variables that split it. But in order to revisit that, you probably want to do something similar to what we've done with the CSIA data. So there, there are definitely extensions that you could do to this work that would allow you to look in more detail, maybe focus on a higher quality data set, maybe even a slightly smaller data set where you had more confidence um, in, in the uh, range of properties that you had available. So that there's a lot you could still do from, from what we've done. We haven't I'd say finish this, but good research is never finished. It just asks more questions. Right. Thank you very much. So basically, uh, for any of you, it will be it has been recorded, and uh, you can watch it later on. The beginning and the end will be edited out. All these noises from air conditioning and so on. A small last question from Perinceta: mm -hmm. Is it possible that the results might improve if you add more splitting into more stratigraphic groups? Just yeah, I did. Sense. I did wonder that as well, Oivind. Um, so I think that that's an interesting perspective and it kind of relates to my one of the points I made in the conclusions, which is, is the stratigraphic grouping actually that helpful? So if the upper and, and um, lower um, aspects of uh, the, the spec formation are, 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 stratigra are, are, are depositionally quite different, then lumping them together could could actually be negative. So yes, it, it definitely could. The, there aren't any obvious signals. When you start to look really in, in detail at, the, at the, the data, at least in the data sets we had, it doesn't jump out to me. I've got a bit of an eye for seeing clusters. You know, you use clustering enough and you start to see uh, clusters everywhere, but you have to be very skeptical when you, you do that. Um, I don't see any obvious evidence of strong clustering in, in this data set. So you'd need, I think, additional information to really be confident in, in any kind of um, split of that. But possibly, yeah, by, by looking at more refined uh, intervals, you, you may be able to, at that point, see more of a structured difference. And, and that would definitely help then with the classification. Yeah, I guess then um, now we are reached four o'clock. So thank you very much for you, Dan, and Laura, and also David, uh, for all this really nice talk and then uh, showing the real data, the real life. And then um, if uh, some of the audience can come up with a real magic method to differentiate, it's welcome as a next talk at uh, next webinar. And also I mentioned just for all of you that Next year, we don't have any webinars planned, but we will continue with the schedule. So every last or first Thursday of the month, we will have similar between three and four to allow people to join from other uh, countries. And if anybody has good idea, any good master or PhD study, master thesis, article, a new method, a new, new way of uh, looking at existing data or new, new data sets or new types, regarding geochemistry or petroleum system 
analysis, basic analysis, just please come back to me and then we organize the webinar. It's a good opportunity for, for people to really show their own results. And uh, thank you much again, Dan and Laura and David for the nice talk. And then uh, have a good afternoon for all of you. So now we can conclude the talk. Thank you again, Dan and Laura and David and enjoy the day further. So good. Thanks, Balash. And thanks thank for hosting. Much. And uh, thanks for all the audience for putting up with us and a, a non-geochemist talking about geochemistry. So uh, Okay. All good. Thank then. you. Thank you. Have a good day. Good afternoon. Bye then. Bye-bye.